The following is a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. We hope that you find today's lesson presented by our minister, Dr. Joseph Becker, informative, insightful, and inspirational. People often pose the question as though they are asking something profound, what is the meaning of Christmas? But I've yet to hear an answer to that question that I find very satisfying. And I think that the reason for that is because the question as stated isn't very well appointed. Because it assumes that at its core, the primary value of the incarnation of Christ lies in what it represents, rather than in what it is. But, beloved, meaning is fungible. If you ask a hundred people what is the meaning of Christmas, you'll get a hundred different answers. Because meaning, as the word meaning is used in our society, is a product of experience. And the experience of Christmas is highly subjective. The day itself is a cipher, a placeholder for whatever meaning we choose to assign to it. And whatever meaning you put into it is the meaning you'll get out of it. So the question, what is the meaning of Christmas, itself is all but meaningless. But if instead we were to ask... What is the substance of Christmas? We would get a very different result. Because the substance of Christmas is not subjective, it's concrete. As Paul tells us in Colossians 1.17, we are free in Christ to assign meaning to any day, recognizing that the meaning is but a shadow of the substance, of the reality that lends its significance to that day. Because substance is not fungible. It is what it is. And the substance, the reality that substantiates the shadow we call Christmas, is the incarnation of Christ. Now in our tradition we do not follow the Lenten calendar. Our services week to week are pretty much the same, regardless of the season. And here at the Steamboat Church of Christ we've been studying the life of Christ for, well, 350 weeks now, about seven years, covering his life chronotopically. And in our studies, we've come to the trial of Christ before Pilate. And last week, we came to the point in the narrative where in John 18:38, Pilate famously asked Jesus, What is truth? Now, the answer to that question on its own isn't actually that hard to find. Classically speaking, we understand truth to be that which corresponds to reality. However, as any first-year philosophy student will tell you, reality is experienced by each of us subjectively. For instance, one of my favorite composers of all time is Igor Stravinsky. Though he died when I was but eight years old, he did not pass before I became enamored of his music, and I have spent so many hours of my life taking his music in that I feel that I know the man through his music. And I've yet to hear a composition of his that does not appeal to me. But the experience of listening to his music isn't a joy to all who hear it. After the debut of his violin concerto in 1931, New York Times music critic Herbert F. Pazer wrote, I do not object so much to the gargoyle features of its wanton ugliness as to the patent calculation of the obvious futility of this ugliness. It may be that closer acquaintance with this music may modify the feeling of ignoble artifice, vacuity, and cynical sophistication with which it diffuses. For one hearer, at any rate, the concerto stands in the vanguard of Stravinsky's most regrettable aberrations. The reality of the experience of listening to Stravinsky is a subjective reality, and every listener will perceive the sound of his music in a unique way. And this is so when it comes to almost every reality. Every person's perception is subjective. Every person, that is, except for one. Because there is one observer, one listener, one discerner, one seer, who always sees clearly. And that observer is God. In the case of our current example, the experience of listening to Stravinsky's Violin Concerto in D is a subjective reality, but the substance of that work is not subjective. The substance is objective. Like it or not, it is what it is. And God knows what it is. He knows what was in Stravinsky's heart and in his head and in his hands when he wrote it, 
He knows how the music looks on the page and how its strains, when played by skilled players, resonate in the environment to which it is entrusted. Is it beautiful? As I perceive it, yes. But it isn't my perception that matters. It's God's perception that matters. That's why among Christian theologians, when we define truth, we define it as that which corresponds to reality as reality is perceived by God. Because God's perception is the gold standard. So at its base, the question posed by Pilate in John 18.38, what is truth, isn't all that difficult to answer, at least in theory. Truth is that which corresponds to reality as perceived by God. Now, there are those who would say that that's not really much help because we do not have access to the mind of God. And to make their case, they may go to Romans 11, 33 through 34, where Paul says, Oh, the depths and the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? But when they do so, they're taking those words out of context. Because what Paul is doing in this passage and in the surrounding chapters is unraveling the mystery of divine election. Beloved, the Greek word mysterion, which is translated mystery, occurs 27 times in 27 verses in the New Testament. Used thrice by Jesus, quars by John, and ventaints by Paul. It's a $10 word for 20 times. Um. <laughs> and every time the word is used, the mystery is explained. The word mystery is not used in the Bible as a smokescreen for that which cannot be understood. It is used as a declaration that that which had hitherto been unexplained has now been made clear. In Romans 11.34, Paul asks rhetorically, Who has known the mind of the Lord? And in 1 Corinthians 2.12-16, he gives a definite answer to that question, saying, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, revealing spiritual realities to you who are spiritual beings. The natural person does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person discerns all things, even as he himself remains inscrutable to the world. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And the we here, as I understand the matter, is the apostles, whose minds were opened by the Lord in Luke 24, 45, that they might understand, and who have revealed the mind of the Lord to us in the pages of Holy Scripture. Thus, what is revealed to us in the Word of God is not first and foremost meaningful. It is first and foremost substantive. And that brings us back to where we started today. What is the meaning of Christmas? I don't know. And I wouldn't presume to tell you because as far as I can tell, the Bible doesn't say. But I can tell you what the substance of Christmas is because the Bible has a lot to say about that. Now, this requires us to get down to basics, so down to basics we go. The purpose for which Jesus came to earth was to glorify the Father. And our salvation serves that purpose, not the other way around. Jesus did not come to earth first and foremost to save us, glorifying the Father in the process. No, Jesus came to earth first and foremost to glorify the Father, which goal he accomplished by saving us. In John 17, we have what is known as the high priestly prayer of Jesus, the prayer that he prayed after the Last Supper, but before leaving the upper room to go to Gethsemane. And four sentences into this prayer, in John 17, 4, Jesus says to the Father, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. I have glorified you on earth. 
Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a lowly birth? To fulfill his reason for being, to glorify the Father. Now I know that that's not how the song goes. According to the song, the reason why Jesus chose a lowly birth is because he loved me so. And that is true, but it isn't the whole truth. In John 3.16, Jesus said to Nicodemus, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but should have eternal life. And if you take that verse on its own, then what you get is what everybody thinks they already know. The motivation for Jesus coming to earth was his love for us, and the result of his coming is eternal life for those who believe in him. But if you venture to seek the whole counsel of God on the matter, you find that there's more to it than that. In John 3, Jesus tells us what we get in the transaction of salvation. But in John 17, he tells us what he gets out of it. In John 3, we learn that because Jesus came to earth, we receive eternal life. But in John 17, we learn what eternal life is. John 17, 3, And eternal life is this, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life consists of knowledge of the Father and of the Son. And as you know, the knowledge of which Jesus speaks here isn't merely head knowledge, but heart knowledge. Eternal life isn't knowing about the Father and the Son. Eternal life is knowing the Father and the Son. And biblically speaking, knowledge involves intimacy. In Genesis 4.1, we read that Adam knew his wife, Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain. And that isn't a euphemism. That isn't code. That isn't just a polite way of saying that Adam and Eve consummated their marriage. In the Bible, the language of knowledge is used to refer to intimacy. And that's the way it's used in John 17.3. Eternal life is this, that we may know the Father and the Son whom he sent. Or as Jesus puts it a few verses later in John 17, 20 through 26, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and you in me that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, even as I am in them. Beloved, the oneness of which Jesus speaks here is unity of heart and mind and soul and strength. And as we take on oneness with Christ, we take on not just his mind, but his heart as well. That is, we become one with Christ in our purposes, in our reason for being. Christ did not come to earth to fulfill our heart's desires by doing our bidding. He came to earth to captivate our heart's desires that it would become our joy to do his bidding. That's what Christ gets out of coming to earth. That's the upshot for him in granting us eternal life because what eternal life is is co-intimacy with God and with Jesus Christ whom he sent, and solidarity with Christ in his mission. Because what the Father sent the Son to do, according to John 17, 4, is to glorify the Father on earth. And because we know the Son, we are one with them in that enterprise. Our reason for being is to glorify the Father in the name of the Son. That's why Jesus came to earth to engage us in that enterprise. That's one of the things that Paul tells us in his great hymn to the incarnation of Christ in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, where he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, 
With these words, Paul calls us to co-intimacy with Christ, beckoning us to be one with Him. And one with Him in what sense? Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. That's the incarnation. That's Jesus being born of Mary. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And that's our salvation. But that isn't the end of the story. That's the middle of the story. Our salvation isn't an end in and of itself. It's a means to an end. Jesus died on the cross and saved us in order to accomplish something else. Something greater. Therefore... God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, every knee in heaven, every knee on earth, and every knee under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But that isn't the end of the story yet, either. Yes, Jesus is exalted, but even his exaltation serves another purpose, a greater purpose. And what is that purpose? What is the end game? Why is it that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? To the glory of God, the Father. The substance of the incarnation of Christ, the reason why the Word became flesh, was to fulfill His reason for being, to glorify the Father. But not just to glorify the Father. And this is important. So pay attention to this part, lest you miss this point in today's lesson. Not just to glorify the Father, but to glorify Him on earth. And this is key to answering the question before us today. You see, it may strike you as odd that the location chosen as the optimal location for Jesus to fulfill His reason for being should be the earth. It may seem curious that the arena that Christ would choose in which to do the most important work of his whole existence, at least the most important work that we have on record, the work for which he would receive the name that is above all names, ought to be this carnal world. But think it through. Remember, as I have told you many times, Jesus is not just the nicest person who ever lived. He is also, and more importantly, the smartest person who ever lived. Jesus Christ, the Son, the second person of the Godhead, is both extremely intelligent and extremely resourceful. And his reason for being is to glorify the Father. And the best idea he could come up with for accomplishing that goal, the best enterprise he could conceive of for maximum glory output was creating this physical universe. After all, Christ is the word that proceeded from the mouth of God the Father when he said, let there be. As we read in John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And the purpose of the creation is to glorify the Father. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens do what they were created to do, and that too is the purpose for which we were created. Isaiah 43, 6-7, I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, keep them not back. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, for I have created them for my glory. That's why we were created, and that's why we were redeemed. Ephesians 1, 11 through 12, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should exist expressly for the praise of his glory. And that isn't simply a privilege upon which we have a grasp. That is a privilege upon which we hold the patent. As Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 1.20, 20, 
For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God through us. Now stop and think about that for a moment, because what Paul is saying in this verse is mind-boggling. According to Paul, we are not the primary beneficiaries of the promises of God. No, the primary beneficiary of the promises of God is God. According to Paul, all the promises of God, that is, every word that God has ever spoken that carries any promissory or covenantal weight, inclusive of the whole apparatus of redemptive history as spoken into being by God, are fulfilled in Christ. But wait, there's more, because the promises of God aren't ends in and of themselves. They are means to an end. And what is that end? What is the ultimate purpose for which the promises of God have been proffered and fulfilled? Unto the glory of God. But that isn't even the most amazing part. Because according to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1.20, though we are not the primary beneficiaries of the promises of God, we are the primary means by which those promises are fulfilled. For all the promises of God in Christ are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God through us. Why did Jesus come to earth to fulfill his reason for being? Well, because this is where we are. And we, mortal men and women, mortal souls, fallen creatures, born of the flesh, with all of our failings, all of our blemishes, and all of our shortcomings, are the creatures we are the means, we are the vessels through which God the Son has chosen to fulfill his reason for being. The purpose of the creation was always to be the means by which the Son glorifies the Father, and the Lord appointed us to be the crown of his creation. And in spite of the fall, in spite of the fact that Adam reached out his hand, plucked the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and ate of it, the Lord held fast to us as his instrumental means of choice through which to accomplish the premier achievement for which he exists. And in order for him to do that, in order for him to be able to forthrightly say what he says in John 17, 4, when he says, Father, I have finished the work which you gave me to do. I have glorified you on earth. He became a mortal man himself. The word became flesh. And why? Why did he do that? Why take such a drastic measure? Well, because, at least as I understand the matter, he had a great deal of confidence in the designer of this carnal creation, the Father. He had a great deal of confidence in the builder of this carnal creation, himself. And in spite of the fall, he had a great deal of confidence in his handiwork in us, in this carnal creation. And he knew both how to debug the creation and how to boost its performance to maximum efficiency. All he had to do was to inhabit it himself. So that's what he did. The Word became flesh. Christ was born of Mary. The Lord became human. He became a living soul, a living human body, inhabited by a living human spirit. And he walked the earth for 30 some odd years as a living soul. And he died as a living soul. And he was raised as a living soul, now glorified and seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning over the kingdom of God in glorified flesh. And he did all that so that his Holy Spirit, which now inhabits his glorified body in heaven, could through the fellowship of the Spirit also inhabit our mortal bodies on earth. Thus, empowering us to do what we were created to do in the first place, and to do it better than Adam and Eve ever could. To glorify the Father in the name of the Son, and in the process, he demonstrated that the Lord's confidence in the Father, his confidence in himself, and his confidence in his creation, his confidence in us, was not misplaced. That's the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Romans 3, 21 through 22, but now the righteousness of God, the righteousness to which the law and the prophets testify has been manifested apart from the law, for through the faith of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God is wrought in all who believe. Galatians 2, 16, for we know that a man is justified not by works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus. This is why we have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, I invite you to go and look these up for yourselves in the Greek, if you can, if you can find the resources. And while you're at it, look up Galatians 3.22, Ephesians 3.12, Philippians 3.9, Colossians 2.12, and Revelation 14.12. This isn't a mistake. It isn't a misprint. It isn't a mistranslation. Yes, we must put our faith in Christ, and there are many passages that say so, but there are no fewer than eight passages in the New Testament that tell us that the reason why faith in Jesus Christ accomplishes what it accomplishes is because of the faith of Jesus Christ. Well, his faith in what? His faith in the Father, his faith in himself, and his faith in creation. That is, his faith in us. Christ has a job to do. He has a reason for being, which is to glorify the Father. And in order to fulfill his reason for being, he bet the farm on this carnal creation. And he had so much faith in the Father's design and in his own execution of that design and in the product of that design that he wagered his own equality with the Father on its efficacy and setting his very self-existence at stake committed himself lock, stock, and barrel to this carnal world inhabiting it and inhabiting us for the glory of the Father. That's the reality of which Paul speaks in Colossians 1.27 when he tells the Christians at Colossae, Christ in you is the hope of glory. The Word became flesh, and in so doing gave substance to the hope in which this carnal world was created in the first place, that according to its design, it would produce glory for the Father in the name of the Son. What is truth? Truth is that which corresponds to reality as perceived by God. What is the true meaning of Christmas? I don't know the meaning. But I know the substance. Because I know the truth of the incarnation of Christ as perceived by God, because the Bible, which is the word of God, reveals this substance to us. In an unparalleled demonstration of his faith in the Father, his faith in himself, and his faith in us, the Word became flesh, and in so doing fulfilled his reason for being, to glorify the Father. Christ in us is, in fact, and in truth, the hope of glory. That's the substance of Christmas. In the incarnation of Christ, we now have the awesome responsibility and the awesome privilege of participating in the greatest for-profit enterprise ever undertaken. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the heavenly angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us. Abide with us. Our Lord Emmanuel. That's my lesson for today. Merry Christmas, everybody. This has been a presentation of the Steamboat Church of Christ. We hope that you have found Dr. Becker's message well appointed. To hear more lessons like this one, visit our website at www.steamboatchurch.org or come see us at 1698 Lincoln Avenue in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Bible classes are Sunday mornings at 9.30 and worship services are at 10.30. We look forward to meeting you.
Until then, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.